so uh, today we'll walk you through a paper a research paper which i found uh, which talks about prediction of churn in a business to business software as a service context so uh, before we go into what technique was used and so on i'll just give an overview of what churn is so churn is an event where a customer quits using a company's products or services and uh, there is also some, something called as partial churn where when the customers stop using a service for some time due to economic reasons and then come back after that so you know i stop using the product or service for a couple of months and then a couple of months later i start using it again so that is also part of churn what we call as partial churn now churn is of two types so one is called as deliberate churn and then there is something called as incidental churn now deliberate churn is where uh, the customer uh, is could be dissatisfied with the service or they might not have need for the service anymore or they they could have some other alternate form of service so uh, when the customer deliberately makes the choice on his or her own to leave that product or service uh, that is called as deliberate churn uh, if the customer is in a situation where uh, they don't make that choice but uh, due to certain circumstances they are not able to continue usage of the product or service we call that as incidental churn for example uh, so in a b2b context right so if the company cuts the budget for the subscription uh, or if there is a change in the system infrastructure uh, or any financial troubles or so on uh, so in in all these cases it is not the uh, end end users choice to stop using the product or service but uh, they don't have any other option so uh, these cases we call them as incidental churn so this is just an overview of churn and uh, the following are the main factors influencing churn uh, so again this has been cited uh, based on several other articles and research papers so the number one factor influencing churn is the customer dissatisfaction this might be due to the quality of the service that is being provided uh, the pricing and the encounter or the interactions with the service personnel or the customer care Uh, and then you have other customer related variables you know the uh, age demographics what kind of in the industry sector are they in what kind of business do they have and so on and then uh, we have the customer status so what sort of account do they have with the company uh, and uh, you know how for how long they have been using that account uh, how much do they pay for that account and so on and then the service usage service usage is something but uh, how do they use the subscription how often do they use it what features do they use it and so on and then we have the switching costs now here the interesting thing is the higher the cost of switching from one product or service to another the uh, lower the probability of churn okay. uh, so this you know this might be in terms of uh, a contract that stipulates you know, if you start using this product or service then you have to use it for a minimum of x number of months okay or uh, you know that product or service might require a high level of infrastructure uh, you know in terms of the software configurations or the uh, you know effort time and effort needed to set that software up and if you are going to discard that and switch to another product or service then uh, that is basically a very costly affair right so in these cases if the switching cost is high then the probability of churn is going to be low uh, and then uh, obviously attraction from competitors could be one main reason for churn and then uh, ethical problems and security issues so for example uh, you know we all always talk of so companies you know when they uh, you know, try to install products from other, other software vendors they scrutinize those products to ensure that they are falling within their security requirements and uh, data privacy privacy requirements and so on right so uh, in case any of these conditions are not met then that could possibly be a reason for churn or for example let's say the security certificates have not been updated in a while uh, or if the uh, company has stopped supporting one particular form of security uh, so due to due to these reasons also the uh, customer might you might stop using that product or service now uh, the cost of churn is another important metric when we talk about churn so the cost of churn consists of two components so one is the customer acquisition cost and then the customer retention cost so uh, acquisition cost is you know, how much do you spend to get the customer onto the platform retention cost is nothing but how much do you spend to ensure that the customer continues to use the platform 
so cost of churn is the combination of these two points so that uh, so um, so when the customer actually uh, you know, stops using the product or service then uh, so this is the amount of money it costs you no uh, so just to uh, add a uh, sign i think this is good i think it's going pretty well i think the factors influencing and introduction have been fantastic uh, i just thought in this particular point right the cost of churn uh, i i don't know what exactly they said in the paper i think you're probably you know sort of showing what they have said in the paper um, but i think it also includes the uh, loss of revenue which is a very big factor right So especially in a SaaS kind of a service, right? What happens is, uh, so you know, it's a subscription, the entire subscription, you know, uh, revenue. Okay, that will go down, and you know, because it's all like fixed cost, right? So they have a lot of fixed costs, and this is a subscription model, which means that people are just subscribing to it. So whatever revenue they get, right? So. their let's say you know just to give you a quick example let's say uh their profit has been let's say you know 1 million dollars or let's say 100000 just you know 100000 dollars is that profit right if let's say 10 customers were lost okay 10 into 100 let's say 1000 dollars is a lost revenue for example right their profit goes down by 1000 dollars right it doesn't go down by a small you know number it goes down by whatever is the revenue that's lost their profit goes down by that much okay their cash resources go down by 1000 dollars and so on and so forth so i think in this particular case uh, i would feel that if i were them i would say that the lost revenue is also part of uh, cost of churn just to add index does the same thing like anything okay. that is churn they just remove all the complete arr of that customer correct yeah so that's the churn right that's how they are calculating yeah. it yeah i think in this particular case uh, you you are absolutely right there uh, swat i think what sai is saying is what is the cost of churn that is what i think is is basically saying uh, the churn totally includes that uh, i think basically what i'm saying is the acquisition cost plus the retention cost plus the revenue the churn revenue those are the three components i think that uh, we should uh, include here yeah okay. anyway yeah but anyway, please carry on Uh, so just to give an overview of the company in which the research was carried out uh, so this company is a digital marketing campaign management company and what they do is they offer a web application that can be used with a web browser to manage digital marketing campaigns run on social media sites so for example let's say uh, i am running multiple campaigns uh, across google ads facebook instagram or youtube and so on and uh, i so this company gives me software to which i can subscribe so that i can track and manage the performance of uh, these campaigns so i can track uh, metrics like the cost of acquisition uh, the number of clicks and uh, so on or let's say for example i am running an email campaign then i can uh, track the click through rates so uh, so this soft, software application basically gives customers a visibility into how they different uh, social media marketing campaigns are performing and if any company wants to use this service then they uh, pay a subscription fee to this company so uh, and how that fee is paid is basically uh, a certain percentage of the customers digital marketing spend is paid to the company and this company uh, that, that is the digital marketing campaign management company wants to understand when churn is happening and what is causing that churn so this is the context so uh, just a schematic showing the service model so uh, these are the several advertising pl- platforms and so this is the name of the company that smart ly.io and uh, here they have this platform which takes in the uh, ad data to so create create and manage ads and then uh, customers can manage those ads and uh new performance of those ads here and they also have a customer support component built in as well so uh what so the following has been have been cited as the biggest challenges in predicting churn uh, in the current situation so the first one that they have cited is the data quantity 
so they had around uh, 800 to 1000 customers and uh, uh, so the machine learning algorithms that they used so here's where uh, they encountered the biggest challenge because it's it's not like a typical uh, retail or e-commerce kind of a data set where you have data for uh, lakhs and lakhs of customers right so here the data quantity itself was not that high and then there was a huge class imbalance now for those of us who are not familiar uh, class imbalance is uh, something that you encounter almost every time you're dealing with a classification problem in machine learning so let's say for example you're dealing with a simple uh, problem such as the credit card uh, default situation right so it's not like uh, you know it's highly unlikely that more than half of the people uh, or a significant proportion of your customer base has defaulted on the credit card payments right so it could be well whether it's credit card default or loan default only let's say for example around 5% of the customers might have defaulted on their credit card payments or loans okay so if you are using this kind of a data set to predict whether a customer is going to default on the credit card payment or the loan payment then uh, your if you use the machine learning model as it is on the data set then it's not going to give you good results because of the class imbalance so the class imbalance is nothing but that situation where you know, only 2 or 3% of the uh, samples have have one particular uh, class label you know they might not have paid the amount and the remaining 97 98% have paid the amount so this is what we call as imbalance okay. and uh, they also face the same problem here where a very uh, small percentage of the people only have churned so they have not given the exact percentage here but uh, they have mentioned that they faced this uh, class imbalance and then uh, the noise in the data the outliers the missing values and so on and uh, one other important factor is that churn might be caused by factors that are not present in the data so for example in the first slide we talked about two types of churn the deliberate churn and the uh, incidental churn right now using the customer behavior uh, and the customer status and such other such other, such other factors you can predict churn you can predict only the deliberate churn but what about that uh, incidental churn no it could be caused by the budget cuts in the customers company right so we are not aware of these uh, factors and we cannot quantify these factors or bring these factors anywhere inside our data now this is also uh, one big challenge in predicting churn so uh, these are the features that they have used so they have categorized the features uh, into these main categories so first one is what they call as business metrics uh, so here uh, they had this amount that the customer uh, spent uh, through the campaign management platform and facebook uh, so this was measure, measured in euros and then uh, to what degree each feature of the platform has been used by the customer and then uh platform usage metrics you know how much time the customer has spent and then uh level of service quality customer satisfaction uh and uh, how many incidents the customer has reported uh bugs and uh, other problems that they have faced so these are the data points that they had used and uh, this was the approach that was followed so they had considered customers who have been using the service for at least 3 months and uh, the data in the original format was the time series data so it would have been usage level data right so on each day each user id uh, how did they use the platform what was the time spent uh, what activities did they do what buttons did they click and so on so that would have been the structure of the data and uh, this time series data they first converted into a customer level data so uh, you know, the features that we talk about here right so uh, how much did they spend how much did each customer spend how much time did each customer uh, spend on the platform and so on so they converted this time series data to the customer level data and then they did what is called as over sampling to balance the class now <coughs> in machine learning if you're trying to resolve this class in balance then there are two ways you can go about it one is called as over sampling and the other uh, so one is called as over sampling and the other is called as under sampling now over sampling is where you duplicate the existing classes so i told you right the 2% or the 3% of the class label which is in minority 
So in oversampling, what you do is you create duplicates of those minority classes so that uh, the, the proportion of that minority class becomes substantial. That is oversampling. In other sampling, what you do is you take a smaller sample of the majority class and then you mix that with the minority class. That is undersampling. So just a simple way to remember this oversampling is where you make the minority class bigger. Undersampling is where you make the majority class smaller. Okay. Uh, but here in this particular case, they perform the oversampling on the data and then uh, they perform the cross validation. Here they used a 80% portion of the data for training and 20% of the data for testing. And then they tried out four different models. So one first one that they tried was called the LSTM, a long short term memory model. And then they tried out a convolutional neural network model. And they also tried out a support vector machine and a random forest. Now just to give you a quick overview of what these models are, uh, the LSTM and the convolutional network, neural network are deep learning models. So uh, the difference between LSTM and convolutional neural networks that, so LSTM is also a kind of a neural network model only, but it has something called as memory cells. So these memory cells in the LSTM are capable of uh, you know, rem remembering or storing information about patterns uh, which are present in like huge amounts of data. So that, so that is, so in that way, the LSTM actually gives you a slight advantage over the neural network model. So neural networks, uh, as you may be familiar, so we have, uh, it is the multi-layer perceptron kind of a model where we have the uh, input layer and the output layer. So between these two layers, we have a hidden layer. Uh, uh, so the LSTM is also a similar model, but the difference is that uh, it has those memory cells which are capable of retaining those patterns and learning from them. And uh, support vector machine, so we have discussed this in a previous session. Uh, so support vector machine, basically what it tries to do is it, uh, it draws that uh, vector in that sample space. And the way in which it creates this vector is that uh, it, it creates this in such a way that there is a maximum separation between the different uh, classes of the data. That is a support vector machine. Uh, random forest is a very commonly used uh, bootstrap aggregation technique. So it takes different combinations of uh, the features that you feed in the data and it arrives at that particular combination of features which gives the highest accuracy. That is the random forest model. So uh, these were the four techniques that were tried out on the data set. And uh, the results are, it might be the results might be different from what we might typically expect okay so interestingly the deep learning models that is the lstm and the cnn models uh, gave a very low precision now typically when you talk about uh, the classification problems we don't measure the accuracy of the model as such but precision is the more important metric to measure so out of so precision the formula is like the true positive divided by the true positive plus false positive. That is out of the total uh, labels in the data which were actually positive, how many of them were uh, your model able to predict? So that is the precision. That is the more important metric than accuracy when it comes to measuring the effectiveness of the uh, classification algorithms. So here the precision of the LSTM and the CNN model uh, were a bit low compared to the other two models that were used. Now, the reason for this has been stated that uh, since the data was not huge, these deep, deep learning algorithms were not able to work effectively. Uh, so that is the reason that has been stated. But on the other hand, if you see the uh, support vector machine and the random forest model have performed uh, better than the deep learning models. And uh, the support vector machine gives the highest precision of 84%. Uh, and uh, oh, there was... Uh, excuse me, yeah, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, roughly, what was the data used? I mean, uh, the the number of data points? Uh, around 800 to 1000 observations. Oh, okay, okay, okay. All right, got it. Okay, all right. Yeah. So, uh, yes, uh, so I think one other thing that I just noticed is that, see, generally, um, I think n no wonder the deep learning works did not work. But uh, generally, I, I'm not so sure why they even used uh, CNN, right? Because 
uh, convolutional neural networks uh, are typically used to you know for uh, like image recognition kind of uh, you know uh, uses right so the way convolutional neural network uh, sort of works is that it will take a small you know a few pixels and then it sort of compares it with the pixel of the you know the target right and then it'll keep going you know sort of pixel by pixel pixel by pixel it'll keep going around you know that is why it is called a convolutional neural network okay and uh, i wonder why they actually used uh, that okay you know so but but you know i think the uh, resp- the, the result of the precision seems to be very low and uh, but what is surprising is actually that the random forest also performed so poor right 54% is not much and that that could be because of very low you know volume of data okay. because yeah okay. please uh, so they had also mentioned you know, they had used the uh, grid search approach for tuning the hyperparameters of these models but even after all that even after the cross validation uh, since this was the best accuracy that they were able to get Uh, the best precision that is okay got it, got it. Uh, and uh, as a result of the random forest model so typically the random forest model if you see uh, you know, it gives something called as the feature importance plot and uh, when they applied the random forest model on this particular data these were the features uh, that they got in the decreasing order of importance the first or the most important feature uh, the platform usage metrics Uh, and then interestingly it is the service quality metrics and then the business metrics how much money did they spend on the ads uh, and then the feature usage metrics so these were the uh, features in the decreasing order of importance so yeah that is all i had for today